Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In him we have redemption, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Grab a hold of that word for a minute, lavished. God gave his grace extravagantly to us. He didn't hold it back. The worship team and, and I were talking yesterday about how God didn't take a little eyedropper and just drop little bits of grace on us. And it's never because we earn it. That's the opposite of grace. He lavished grace upon us when we needed him and could do nothing about it. Ephesians 2 goes on to say, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, his lavish gift of grace. I hope you recognized the songs that were in the prelude. I need thee every hour. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and amazing grace. That song could have been called Lavish Grace. But those three songs tell our story. Without him, we are in desperate, dire need. And so we focus our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, the only one who can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And then we step into his amazing, lavish, extravagant grace. That is the message that we want you to soak in this morning. Bask in his grace while we praise him with songs that just begin to touch the very tiniest part of how we can express back to him how much we love and appreciate him. But he receives this praise as a precious, holy, sacred gift. So stand with us, would you? And let's praise the Lord this morning.
that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so The Lord of all, our rescuer, our redeemer, the one, the only one that can pay our ransom, the only one. Imagine that most holiest of beings surrendering to his father's will, stepping out of the glories and the prerogatives of heaven to come down here on this broken, lost planet to rescue us. He gave up everything to rescue us. I don't know what comes over you when you think about that, but when I reflect on everything he gave up, and, and I only know this much of what he had to give up, when I think about that, all I want to do is say, I love you. Yeah. That's all I can say. And so we're going to sing that to him this morning, how much we love him. Oh. 
Dear Jesus, we do want to live our lives for you alone, but we know we can't do that apart from you. I pray that you would empower us, Lord, that you would help our eyes to see the things that you want us to see. Help our ears to hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit through the cries of those around us that need you. I pray that every part of every day, we would give thought to what it might be that you would have us do. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we could do more than just sing these words, but that we might be able to live these words. We want, Lord, to be a reflection of your goodness and your holiness and your purity and your lavish grace upon this earth. And I pray, Lord, that you would empower us to do that through your Holy Spirit, who prompts us daily to bring glory and honor and praise to you. We ask these things in your holy and your awesome name. Oh. 
are really powerful words to sing to the Lord because we know we don't really surrender everything. So let's just take a few minutes and allow the Holy Spirit to bring to our minds just one thing that he wants us to surrender today.
have come full circle this morning, beginning with our acknowledgement of needing you, turning our eyes to you, sharing our love with you, and bringing us right back to the place that we started, still in so much need of who you are every moment of every day. Lord, I pray that you would use us today through the rest of this worship time, that you would use the activities this week that our church family will participate in, that you will use Gary's message for us this morning that we know you have prepared his heart to deliver. We ask you, Father, to use this church family in such a powerful and an awesome way that we could live lavishly in your grace because we know that our dependence is fully and totally on you. And Lord, we commit the rest of this service to you, that every thought, every word, every action would be pleasing in your sight, and that you would help us, Father, to rejoice in the fellowship time to come, and that we would rejoice in all that you've done through this past year through Gary, your humble servant. We praise you and thank you and honor you for his sacrifice here in our body. And we thank you, Lord, for watching over Gary and Susie as they move forward in a new ministry. And Father, we know that you have great plans for us as well. And so we just commit those to you now, Lord. And we honor and thank and praise you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give this service back to you, Lord, in your name. Amen. I couldn't help but think as we were worshiping together that uh, scripture teaches us that we love him because he first loved us. We obey him because of our love for us. And then we surrender to him, which is our reasonable service as a living sacrifice, as Paul teaches us in Romans 12. Ladies, thank you for leading us to the throne of grace as you yourselves were worshiping as well. Just a couple of things for uh, clarity this morning. This morning we only have um, children's ministry for up through first grade. So second through six will need to be down in here with us this morning. But it's not a consolation prize, but it is a gift that was planned for them this morning. So all the children through sixth grade get one of these. It will be on the table in the uh, area out there. Also, I want to just highlight that this Wednesday, we will be having a congregational meeting here at 6.30. And don't forget about bringing shoeboxes in. And uh, Barb wanted me to share with the congregation that it was a great time yesterday with the winter warm up. So thank you for all who are participating in that community outreach and administering to those who came and received things and clothes for them and their families. Uh, this morning, um, there will be a flow, as we were talking about with Gary earlier this morning, a flow. <laughs> um, after Gary has challenged us with the word of God this morning, we would like everyone to stay right where you are here in the sanctuary. And Bill will be sharing with us how we're going to be organized to um, take a picture as a congregation to, uh, to be able to give a, a memory for Gary and Susie and their ministry with us this past year. So after the picture, then we'll be asking everybody to move from here into the gym, of which we'll have a few words there and some prayer, and then we're going to be able to eat together and fellowship together in a send-off for Gary. Gary, please come share the word with us. Oh, great. Well, it is uh, amazing how quickly a year goes uh, since first coming to be with you all, November the 1st, 2020. And uh, I remember just before coming up here, sitting in Uncle John's coffee shop in Marion and looking out uh, the window there, there's one tree in that parking lot that seems to be the first tree to change colors. And that particular morning, it was like really bright, reds and yellows and oranges and it was just spectacular and this week i was sitting in that same spot and i looked out the window it was like deja vu all over again there's that tree and it just was spectacular and it was a reminder to me that uh, that a year does go quickly 
But it's been a, a good year. I've enjoyed this year. Uh, I often uh, have reminded you that back right out of high school, I spent two weeks doing ministry in Vermont. And then in 1991, I was uh, an interim pastor, not an intentional interim, pa interim pastor, but they called me their interim pastor and consultant in Rutland, Vermont. And now here's an opportunity to return again. So it has been uh, wonderful to be here with you all. This morning, I'm going to, uh, I think, in a, in, a, in a sense, wrap up my one year here, challenge you for the future. And the, uh, the title of the message is, If Jesus Ran My Life, If Jesus Ran My Church. Uh, a number of years ago, I did a series uh, at South Coast Community Church on the book of Colossians, and that was the title of that series. If Jesus Ran My Life, If Jesus Ran My Church, what would it look like? A number of years ago, uh, John F. Walvert, who was the president of Dallas Seminary for many years, finally retired, and they were trying to figure out who were we going to get to replace uh, this man. He was an icon there, and they decided that they were going to hire Chuck Swindoll. Many of you have heard him over the years on the radio, and some people were uh, a little uh, taken back that they hired a pastor and not an academic uh, scholar, somebody with his doctorate. He he, uh, Chuck actually didn't even graduate from Dallas Seminary. He completed the program, but since he didn't have a bachelor's degree, they couldn't give him the master's degree. And yet he has proven himself an incredibly skilled communicator over the years. So they felt like since we're trying to prepare you know, men and women to go out into ministry, why not get somebody who's out there in ministry? And so they decided to choose a pastor. But that left him with a dilemma because he was pastoring First Evangelical Free Church in Fullerton, California. He had a church of about 5,000 and he regularly preached every week and those sermons often got transcribed into books and they went on the radio. So what's he going to do now? So he decided to start a church and he started a church north of Dallas and I think on the first Sunday that this church meant there was like 2,000 people there. If you want to start a church and have it take off, you hire Chuck Swindoll. <laughs> but before the year was up, there was like 4,000 people and, uh, coming to that church. And, and uh, that's really not a good church planting plan because there's only one Chuck and you're not going to grow like crazy. But there is another alternative. And the other alternative is to allow Jesus to be in charge of our church. And if Jesus ran my life, and if Jesus ran my church, what would it look like? And that's what we're going to do. And uh, the thoughts this morning are taken from Colossians chapter 1. You can turn there in your Bibles or you can just watch the scripture as it comes on the screen. But what is going to be going on on Sunday mornings for the rest of the fall here is uh, as a church, I'm going to kick it off and then it's going to be continued. We're going to look at the vision and the values and the mission that we decided upon as a church that began when we did three summits last spring and in early summer. Uh, it was worked through over the summer and the fall by the transitional leadership team and the elders and other people from the congregation gave input. And then there was this final uh, statement that uh, has come out. And today, let me see, am I going backwards again? All right, it is on. Today we're going to look at a core value of what it means to be God-centered and Jesus-focused. I'm going to give it another shot, and if not, I'm going to just let it go. But the value number one, after we have a mission and a vision, is we decided we want to be known as a God-centered, Jesus-focused church. And so it just makes sense to look at what that means from Colossians chapter 1, I think we get a beautiful picture of it. Earlier in the year, we looked at Ephesians. And Ephesians, really, the theme of Ephesians is Jesus, uh, the, the church as the body of Christ. Colossians, though, focuses on Jesus as the head of the church. And so, if Jesus is the head of the church, if Jesus is running our lives, running our church, what's it going to look like? If Jesus ran my life, and here's a big idea, if you have your uh, bulletin and you're following along, if Jesus ran my life and my church, we'd all be more like him and less like us. And isn't that the point? 
And when I say less like us, I'm not saying that to denigrate who we are because Jesus lives his life through us, through our personality, you know, through our strengths and our limitations as individuals. But the point of the whole Christian life is to let Jesus so get into our lives that he's able to live his, through, his life through us in the unique way he created us. And that is the point. Jesus said uh, when he was, uh, I think one of the most you know, often repeated challenges that Jesus made when he was here on earth was follow me, right? Follow me. That's what he, was, that's what he said to the, to the fishermen by the seaside in Luke chapter 5. Follow me. If you follow me, I will then make you fishers of men. He looked at Matthew, who was nearby at a later time around the area of Capernaum, Capernaum and, and near the Sea of Galilee. He approached Matthew sitting in his tax collector booth and said what? Follow me. Follow me me. That's what he's looking for. That's why if Jesus runs my life, if Jesus runs our church, we will look more like him. We will look less like us. Oh, it is working now. Okay. We got miracle workers up there in the, uh, in the booth. I'm going the wrong direction here again. See, Tom was telling me how good I was getting this down but here it is, if you're taking notes. If Jesus ran my life and my church, we'd all be more like him and less like us. That is the point. And the idea of, of following is, is we become more like him. In the Old Testament, the first command was, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, might, and strength. And it's really the same, same thing in the New Testament. It's only given a little different twist on it. It's following Jesus. That's how. We love God with our whole heart, soul, might, and strength. And so Jesus said, follow me. In Luke chapter 9, when Jesus took three of his followers up on the mountain to show them something spectacular, which was his glory, God spoke into that situation and said, this is my son, my beloved son, my chosen one. And then he follows it by this, listen to him. <laughs> Listen to him. If you want to get me, you're going to listen to him. If you want to get me, you're going to follow him. And so if Jesus ran my life, if he ran my church, we would be more like him and less like us. And that is the point. That is a good thing. And so this morning, let's look first of all at the results. What would happen? What is the result of if Jesus ran my life? And it's in Colossians chapter, three, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And Paul is writing a letter to this church in Colossae. And what's interesting about this church in Colossae, I'll just throw it out. He did not go there and plant this church. When he was in another town, I believe it was Ephesus, but I'm not positive. A man named Epaphras was there listening to Paul's teaching. And he was so captivated by Paul's presentation of the gospel that he accepted Jesus. And he learned, sitting at the feet of Paul while he was there, I don't know how, for how long, but he learned, went back to Colossae and started a church. Amazing, you know. Paul wasn't even there. None of the other disciples were there. Somebody who had been captivated by the love of Christ and the message of the gospel went back and did the only thing that he knew what to do, and that's to share that message with other people. He got involved making disciples, and they made disciples. They had to start a church. Had to start a church. So Paul says this as he writes a letter to them. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. And I think in these verses, we get a picture of what a mature church looks like. Gene Getz wrote a book a number of years ago called The Measure of a Church. 
And the point that he made from some of Paul's letters and the opening thanksgiving or prayers in Paul's letters is that a, a mature church was always characterized by faith, hope, and love. As a church, they, they trusted in Jesus for their salvation, for their sanctification, for their life as a church. Faith in the Lord Jesus is what defined a mature church. And then love for one another, which builds on Jesus' command, again, to love one another the way I loved you. But then they also exhibited hope. Hope. Hope that God would accomplish what he desired to accomplish for them. But the, the interesting thing here that what happens is when a, a, a church exhibits faith in the Lord Jesus, love for one another, hope, and what, what I think he's getting at really with hope is this, is that we live not just for this life, that God has promised us something beyond this life. It's what we sacrifice things in this life for, it's waiting for us. We don't possess it right now. Remember the story of Abraham, if, if, if you know anything about his life, that God made all these promises to Abraham, and some of them came true right then in his life, but there was others that came true after he was gone. And yet he still got the benefit of them because he was the initiator of them. He's the one that got him going. And he, com he finished the mission that God had for him, and there was hope for him in the future. But this is what a mature church looks like. Faith in the Lord Jesus, love for one another, and then hope beyond this. But what happens is this, is that when a church exhibits this kind of behavior, it says that the gospel is going to bear fruit. They're going to be growing, growing throughout the whole world, he's saying. And he's saying, in general, this message of the gospel is bearing fruit all over the world. But he says, it's also been doing that among you since the day you heard it and you truly understood God's grace. It's just what we've been singing about this morning, the gospel, the good news. And to me, the good news that I experienced in the gospel was, first of all, I knew I did not have a chance with God. <laughs> when I was a little kid, they used to tell us that good boys go to heaven and bad boys go to hell. I said, well, I guess I should stand in that line. <laughs> I, I, I knew at a young age I was not a good boy, and I knew what I had done already with my little, you know, 10, 12-year-old life, and I thought it's not going to get any better, and if good boys go to heaven and bad boys go to hell, well, I guess I might as well just get in that line right now, and then at a Christian camp at the age of 12, I heard this incredible message that everybody has a chance with God, even bad boys, and God has provided a way for us to be right with him to have the best possible life here on earth and to spend eternity with him. And guess what? It's a gift. You can just have it. You don't have to be a good boy. And for me, as a youngster, that was a great message. That was good news. Good news. I could be right with God, and it was given to me as a gift, regardless of what I did. And that message took off. And it's about God's grace. It's about God giving us what we don't deserve. And that message was just taking off. And that's what happens in a mature, healthy church. When we trust God the way we ought to, when we love each other the way we ought to, when we defer our gratification and we hope for things in the future and we're able to say no to certain things right now, it will bear fruit. The church will grow. And that's a challenge for us. But sometimes we can get bogged down and, and we, we kind of forget what a mature church is like. So I just want to remind you how we can live that out. It's based on faith in and not fear of. And so we exist as Christians because we put our faith in Jesus and he has given us the gift of life. But that gift of life that we live out for the remainder of our time on earth, we live by faith as individuals. We live by trusting God with our daily life, but also as a church. We live as a church by putting our faith in Jesus and not being afraid of things. That's what happened to Israel, didn't it? When, when in the old covenant, when they came out of the wilderness, or they came out of the wilderness for a couple days or a couple weeks after the exodus took place, and God says it's time to go and take 
the promised land, to go into Canaan. And they, Moses sent out 12 spies, right? And 10 came back and said, no way. Two said, came back and said, way, you know, we can do this. Those 10 acted out of fear. They saw the odds against them. They saw the, the power of the people there and, and the fortress cities and, and how big these people were. And they said, we can't do that. But, but Caleb and Joshua said, yes, we can because we know who God is. We have trust in a big God who just got us out of the most powerful country in the nation when we were slaves. And we not only got out of there, we pillaged them. We came out with spoils and, and, and they were destroyed and we don't even have an army. Of course we can do this. That is faith. But the other said, no, 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 we can't do this. It's fear. And I just, want to try, I just want to challenge this church to act in fear every day of your existence. Pray bold prayers. You know, take on big initiatives. God, what do you want us to do? How do you want us to reach this this area. Everybody says how hard it is to reach New England, and it, and it is. But you know what? Paul said that the gospel was bearing fruit all around the world, and even in Colossae, and all around the world, the gospel is going crazy. In China, China is, uh, is, one, is the second fastest growing church in the world, and look at the oppression. Iran, didn't you just have somebody here that I, I was missing? Iran is the fastest growing church in the world right now. So it can happen here too. And I want to just challenge you, act in faith, not in fear. Pray bold prayers. Go after big initiatives. See what God can do. But a mature church acts by, love, by their love for, not their control of. And, that, and that's how do we relate to people. Do we want to control people? And if we're trying to control people, we don't love them. We, we love people. Loving people means I care as much about your spiritual development, your emotional development, you know, your physical development. I care as much about your development as my own. And I'm going to treat you in such a way that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put your needs ahead of mine. I'm not going to just forget my needs, but I'm going to say yes to yours at first. I'm going to love you. I'm not going to try to control you. I'm not going to try to control you. Uh, you know, we, we have this, uh, this little thing between Susie and I. Uh, she'll, she'll say, would you take the trash out? And I say, is that a question? <laughs> and she'll usually say, no. I said, okay, I didn't think so. But if it was a question, I would have said no. <laughs> it was a command. I went and did it. But the other day, somebody asked me to kind of to, to, to make a sacrifice. Uh, and so uh, I, as I was discussing this sacrifice, he wanted to make it sure that I knew that no was an okay response. I, I would really appreciate it if you do this, but if you don't, that's okay as well. He gave me the freedom there. And that's what love does. Love gives freedom to people. Love makes requests but not demands. Love says, I know what you need, and you know what, I'm going to put your needs ahead of my needs. And and. This is one of the characteristics that define us as a church. Jesus said, people will know. The new brand for Christianity, Jesus said, is love for one another, and not just any kind of love, but love people the way I love. So if you want to know how the people in your life need to be treated, look at how Jesus treated people and treat them that way. And that's what a mature church is like. That's what a mature individual is like as well. But if we want to grow, if we start loving people this way, the gospel will bear fruit. When we make, you know, bold initiatives in Jesus' name and we love our own members the way we love, the way Jesus loved us, that will happen. It's love for, not control of other people. And finally, the hope part is this. It's hope for something in the future, not possessing it right now. So many of us live for today, live for what we can get now, because we think, if I don't get it now, I'm not going to get it. I mean, that's, not, that's not the essence of the Christian life. You know, God told Abraham, I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And he didn't see it. He just saw that one child that was born. But God did keep that promise. And God said Abraham got his reward on the other side because he was living for something that wasn't just now. And we live for something that's not just today, not just time and space. The promise of Christianity is not a better life now. It's a better hope later. But you will live a better life now. And I want to make that clear. 
living for Jesus is a better life now, but that's not the promise. And in and one of those songs we were singing, it talked about the delights that's waiting ahead of us. And, and I, I was talking to, uh, to Clark Agnew last night, and we were talking about you know, heaven and about our reward and about ruling and reigning with Jesus. And he goes, you know, I, I really don't know, you know, what there is for me in this next life because what I get my most of my joy is, is going to a situation where there's a problem and I fix it. He goes, I don't think there's any problems in heaven. I said, yeah, but there's like, you know, a hundred billion, is it a hundred billion galaxies or million that we can see, Bill? Okay. Two billion galaxies out there. And I say, Clark, I think that there's something for you to do out there. <laughs> you know? There's something for us to do. That's where all of our wildest dreams will be fulfilled. You know? That's where, that's why right now I can say no to certain things and yes to other things. That's what a mature church looks like. We are hoping for what God is going to do for us in the future right now. We're on mission for him. And we're saying no to certain things and yes to other things in deference to that mission. Think about, think about Jesus' example when he was tempted in the wilderness. Satan said, hey, if you're hungry, make food right now. Make bread right now, right? You can turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, no, I'll wait. I will wait. Is there anything wrong with being hungry? No, but God says it's not time for food yet. I'm going to wait. And he said, hey, if you bow down and worship me right now, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. They're yours right now. And Jesus said, nope, no thank you. See, they're going to be mine someday anyway. But I'm going to get them from God, and I'm going to get them after I die for the sins of the world. And he raises me up, and he hands them over to me. Jesus said no to right now because he knew there was a better hope on the other side of the cross. And that's what he's asking us to do. And that's the challenge. A mature church, a mature individual. So this is what we're shooting for. That's the result. So what happens if we let Jesus run our life, if we let Jesus run our church? But here are the reasons, Paul says. You know, if, if, here, here are the reasons out there why you ought to let Jesus run your life, why you ought to let Jesus run your church. He is, first of all, the rightful king of creation. Now, if you want somebody to run your life, you want somebody to run your, your, your uh, church, you want to make sure that their resume is adequate to do that, right? Every time I, I go to a church, they want to see my resume. You, can you do what you, what you say you can do? Prove it to us. Show us. Or demonstrate. Well, Jesus, can he run your life? Can he run our church? Colossians 1, 15 to 17 says yes, because he's the rightful king of creation, and here's what Paul means. He says that Jesus, is the, the, Jesus the Son is the image of the invisible God. I mean, he's the exact replica of God. He is God. He is the firstborn over all creation. That does, it's not a chronological term. It's a term of rank. He is first of all creation. He's in charge of all creation. For explaining it in him all things were created in heaven and on earth and might i say by just speaking them into existence visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him he's the agent of creation but he's also the object and for him it was all created for him and for his glory he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the rightful king of creation. He's got an impeccable resume. If he could create the universe, do you think he could go, do creative things in our lives and through our church? That's the kind of guy I want, the, guy, the kind of guy that speaks and things happen. He's creative. He, he, and, but he not only created it, he keeps it going. He sustains it. That's the kind of person I want running my life and running my church. Now, I am prone to anxiety. I just am. It's in my, I don't want to say in my, in, in my sinful DNA. I went to the doctor as a kid, and he gave me a nickname. It was called the worry wart. 
Because every time, even at the age of four, I went into the doctor's office, I'd say, do I have a temperature? Do I got to get a shot? Am I going to have to, are you going to hurt me? Yeah, I mean, you know, the same with the dentist. Are you going to hurt me? Are you going to make me cry? I mean, I just, ah, so much anxiety. And, and when I ended up, uh, you know, a, a, in the orphanage I went to, every time that the pass, the yellow pass would come at lunchtime, says I have to go to the dentist. I've made all kinds of bargains with God. Oh, God, please. I don't want to have a cavity. I promise, you know, I won't curse anymore. Or I won't steal or I won't make fun of people, please. You know, I just worried, 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 worried about everything. Well, you know, with Jesus in our lives, we really don't need to worry. He says he'll take care of us. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be taken care of. And so I've been trying to do that. I really have. And this week was kind of a cool week uh, uh, in that I had a colonoscopy, you know, recently. I know that's too much information. You don't need to know about that. But uh, I had a colonoscopy and, and I, get, I get this bill. I paid $966 ahead of time on a credit card and and we've got insurance and then they're sending me afterwards another bill for four hundred and fifty dollars i'm going really ah this is crazy so i figure out you know that, that, that there's a problem here but you can't get a hold of anybody you know so i called the, the the person in charge of billing oh well we don't handle the that part of the billing these people handle that part of billing and we handle this uh, it was like crazy was, i'm pulling my hair out see it worked so I finally said, all right, Lord, I, I've been round and round. I, I can't get a hold of anybody. I keep on getting this voicemail, and this lady finally told me, well, I'm only in two days a week. So I just said, you know what? This is your baby. I'm not going to worry about this. And I kid you not, I came home a couple nights later, and sitting there, sitting there on our breakfast bar is a check for $966, <laughs> which was more than I expected to get back. And it's like, whoa. Well, two Fridays ago, uh, down in, uh, in Harleysville, Pennsylvania, some Amazon truck trainee driver runs into me. It's like, ah, here we go again. So, you know, I just said, all right, Lord, I, I can't deal with this. I can't get a hold of anybody. Nobody's returning the phone calls. And now they're trying to make me, you know, look like I'm crazy and it's my fault. I said, I, I just, I can't do this. This is yours. I get a phone call the next day, hey, I'm sending an appraiser over. It all looks good. We can see that, you know, this other person was at fault, blah, 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 blah. I mean, isn't it just nice to have the person who created the universe saying, I'll handle these other things for you. Now, it doesn't always happen that quickly, I know, but it is a promise. If you seek my kingdom first, let me run your life. I will take care of the incidentals. I promise might not always be the way you want them to be done, but they will get done. They will get accomplished. That's what happens. He is the rightful king of creation. That's who I want to run my life. That's who I want to run this church. But the reason I say he's the rightful king of creation, he's not in charge right now, is he? I mean, ultimately he is. He's over everything. But right now he is allowing this world to be run by the evil one. And the kingdom of darkness still exists. He has not come and taken over completely as he will one day. So he is the rightful king of creation. He offers to run my life, but we are still going to face opposition from a rival kingdom. But there's another reason that Jesus ought to be the head of my life and my church is he is the actual head of the church. He is running a counter kingdom right now, the kingdom of God has come to earth, not in its complete form. He is the head of that, and he wants us to submit our life and our ministries, our missions to him. He's the actual head of the church. And it says in Colossians 1, 18 to 20, that he's the head of the body, the church. Actually, since we are the body of Christ, it just makes sense, right, that he would be the head, but he just wants to make sure that we understand it. He is the head. He is the ultimate authority, but he's also the source of our life, and that's what a head is. It's authoritative, but it's also a source, and he's a source of our life, and he's a source of everything we do. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. He's the rightful, you know, the actual head of the church. And the reason he's the head, because he's no longer dead. That makes sense? <laughs> if he was dead, he wouldn't be the head of anything, right? 
He died in our place. God accepted his payment and God raised him from the dead and said, you are the head of the church. He's the head because he's no longer dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Again, it's just a reminder, Jesus is God. So if you're going to reject Jesus, you're rejecting God. He says, and through him, through Jesus, to reconcile himself to all things. Because of sin, all creation, including us, including this earth, is at odds with God. And Jesus enabled us to be reconciled, enabled things to be made right, whether they're things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And this is what Jesus did by dying in our place. He was the creator, he's also the redeemer. And that perfectly qualifies him to run our lives and to run our church. The whole idea of reconciliation is that we were enemies of God and he, by dying in our place, allowed God to forgive us, allowed God to give us grace, give us mercy, give us life. And it all happened because Jesus died in our place and he made peace. There was nothing but war between human beings and between God. Jesus made peace. He is putting everything right, making all things well, making all things new. And that's who I want to run my life. That's the reason. He's the rightful king of creation, and one day he will establish his kingdom here on earth. He will bring in a new heavens and a new earth. That's his right, and he will do it when he's ready. But right now, he is the head of his body, the church. And it's a well-supported church because of who he is, the rightful king of creation and the actual head of the church. So he promises to direct us. He promises to direct us. And who do you want to direct your life? <laughs> you know? the, the king of creation who created and sustains, and also the, the, the person you know, God, the son who loved you enough to die in your place. That's how much, you, do you think he can run your life? Do you think you can trust him if you hand it over to him? He promises to direct us. The question is, will we promise to surrender? Like we were singing about earlier. Will we promise to surrender? Or will we fight him? But he promises to direct us. He promises, his promises will sustain us. His promises will sustain us. And that's what we bank on. That's what Abraham banked on. He said, if you follow me, I'll bless you, Abram. And Abram saw a blessing. He saw a lot of blessing. And he saw God work in his life consistently. But he didn't see that ultimate one, how that the whole world would be blessed through him. He didn't see that he would become a great nation. He didn't see that you know, he would have you know, all these descendants. But what sustained him was that promise that God made him, that God fulfilled partially to him, but not completely. His promises will sustain us. But finally, he promises not to enable us, okay? Now, what, what in the world does that mean? He's saying this, it is possible that you can say no to me. You can say no to me running your life. You can say no to me running your church. And I'm not going to enable you. I will let you live out your choices. I won't interfere with them. But you do so to your own peril. We do so to our own peril. Every year in the United States, I've said it before, 4,000 churches close their door. If Jesus was their head, why in the world are they closing their door? The gospel bears fruit wherever it is. I, I think... What happens is, you know, we said we're God-centered, we're Christ-focused. God-centered, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the Trinity. And, and the focus during this era is on Jesus. It's possible, though, for a church not to worship the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, but to worship an unholy Trinity. And here's the unholy Trinity, real, real quickly, idolatry. Is there something in our church or in our life that's more important than Jesus, that's an idol. That will keep us, keep us from being mature as individuals and keep us from being mature as a church. Idolatry. The second one is relational conflict that does not get addressed. Jesus said, love one another as I've loved you, right? 
You got to deal with conflict, but conflict will take us down. You know why? Because if Jesus said the world will know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another and we don't treat each other with love, how are we going to ever grow? How are we ever going to have that brand Christian Jesus follower that he wants us to have? So that, that's the second member of the unholy trinity. And the last one is misuse of power. Misuse of power. So a mature church is going to reject that unholy trinity and they're going to live in the parameters of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. I mean, they all work together, right? Ephesians 1, the Father initiates a program, Jesus implements it, and the Holy Spirit ensures that it's going to get completed. And that's what happens. We are well supported with them behind what we're doing. And finally, though, what's the repercussions of Jesus running my life and Jesus running our church? Now, repercussions, that kind of sounds like a negative term, right? Uh, and I needed another R, and that's the only one I could come up with. So these are good repercussions, okay? There could be bad repercussions, but there could be good ones too, right? right. right, right I hope so. That's, that's kind of what I'm shooting at. It's in verse 28 and 29 of chapter 1. Again, talking about Jesus, God the Son. Uh, he's, he is the one we proclaim. Our message is about Jesus. I mean, uh, you know, we share certain things with Jewish people, right? But it's not Jesus, right? We share certain things with Muslim people. We all believe in a theistic universe, right? That there is one God, Muslims, Jews, and Christians. The differentiating factor is Jesus and the proclamation of the good news that in Christ we can have life in all its fullness. Everybody it's availed to. So he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching. Now admonishing, that, that, that's a negative term. That's warning people because there, there are certain things we need to warn, warn people. If you reject Jesus, you do so at your own peril. He loves you, but he won't enable you. He'll accept your no if you say no. So we are, we're admonishing and we're teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy so that, that Christ so powerfully works in me. The repercussions. The repercussions, we said in, in, in the first the, the idea in the first part of, of the scripture of, of Colossians 1, 3 to 5, is really about becoming a mature church. Faith, hope, and love in Jesus. You, we apply it to our individual lives, but it's really about the church. This is really about individuals. What does a mature individual look like? And a mature individual looks like, in this passage, Jesus. It's about Jesus. Presenting everyone mature in Jesus. And so what does that look like? Well, so, I thought I'd, I'd end with some fun and acronyms. I don't know if you'll ever remember them. I don't know if I can remember them. But the first one, a mature congregation is this, helping people say yes. What, what's the last two stand for? Anybody figure it out? <laughs> Saying yes to, helping people say yes to others, okay? The first four is my, uh, my license plate. So if you ever, you know, see me driving around helping people say yes to others. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus said yes to other people. He said yes to building relationships with people. God, who doesn't need anything from us when he came to earth as a human being, built relationships with people. And there were close relationships with people. And that's what we will look like as a mature congregation, as mature individuals. We will be like Jesus in building healthy, good, intimate, strong relationships with other people, following his example. Helping people, the next is say no to whatever. This is what Jesus modeled for us. He said yes to people. He said yes to healthy relationships. He said yes to his father and what his father had for him to do. But he also knew when to say no. He said no to Satan, right? He said no to Satan through Peter once when Peter said, hey, enough of this talk about death. You know, don't dismiss that. And remember what Jesus said? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I'm saying no to you. He said no to the crowd. And the crowd said, we want to make you king now. You know, when he entered into 
Jerusalem. Now, he knew what to say no to. He knew who to say no to. That's what a mature individual will look like if we are mature in Christ. We know what to say yes to, and that's kind of our yes muscle, you know, if you want to be mature. And then there's our no muscle. That's boundaries. There's certain things I will not do, and certain things Jesus said he would not do. The third thing of a mature, I think, being like Jesus is helping people face reality. We live in a world where there is evil, right? And where there is good. And sometimes that gets really distressing. That gets really distressing. I know one time, uh, you know, I, I was talking to an individual and he was really upset that his parents wouldn't let him you know, go to certain places or watch certain things. He f felt like, you know, I, th th that just, they sh just shouldn't do that. You know, that wasn't fair. And, uh, and I, I said, I said, well, you know, we live in a dark world. We live in a world where there is evil and where evil damages and where evil taints. And of course, they did not want you to see certain things or to go to certain places because they wanted to protect you as long as they could because eventually you're going to see it for what it is. And we live in a world where there is good, but where there's evil and it exists alongside and for us as human beings, we, 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 every time we get into a relationship with somebody, there's something good about them and there's something not so good about them. When we look inside in ourselves and we see there's certain things that are really good about us and there's things that are just, oh, I can't believe I'm still doing that. I st can't believe I'm still thinking that. How do you face that? Jesus helps us to do that. You know how he helps us to do that? He helps us to forgive ourselves and he helps us to forgive others and forgiving doesn't excuse what i'm doing or what other people are doing but it's saying god has made provisions and i can stay in relationships with people and in this world and not get depressed and discouraged because jesus conquered evil jesus is giving me the power to deal with evil in my life and i can live in this world that's that way and not become depressed you know what it was like when you're a kid the first time you got exposed to some horrific things in this world you thought oh my goodness who lives this way why is it this way and Jesus gives us the ability to face reality. He came into a sinful world. He didn't get sucked in by the sinful world, but he made a difference in that sinful world. And that's what he will help us do as well. He will help us deal with unrighteous people. He will help us deal with people who don't know God and, and are unrighteous. And he'll help us to deal with people who do know Jesus and still disappoint us and still sin. He helps us face reality. But the final thing that he does is this. He helps you grow up. He helps you grow up. You know, one of the things that Jesus modeled for us, I think that's one of the, the best things, he knew how to be in authority and he knew how to live under authority. That's an important thing for a mature church and a mature individual. Sometimes I'm called to be under somebody's authority and I want to be under their authority and not be a rebellious teenager and undermine their authority. Sorry, teenagers. See, you guys get a bad rap all the time. You're not necessarily that way. There are adults who are that way too. Anytime they're under authority, they're going to buck it. They're going to push against it. A healthy individual knows how to be under somebody's authority without capitulating to that authority. Because sometimes I was under authority one time and a guy asked me to do something. I said, I can't do that. And he says, well, I'm your boss. You have to do that. And I said, well, then I quit. And I walked out the door. He goes, whoa, 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 come back, come back, come back. You know, let's talk about this. He says, all right, you don't have to do that. So, but I still was under his authority, and I still continued to work there. I just wouldn't do something that would undermine Jesus' authority in my life. So sometimes I need to be under authority. Sometimes I'm in authority. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. And I need to love you and respect you. But if something needs to be done, I need to hold you to that. And Jesus, didn't he do that? He did that. He, he was under the authority of God the Father. He was God. He, he placed the free use of all his attributes off to the side. And he did what God wanted him to do when he wanted to do it and how he wanted him to do it through the power of the Spirit. See, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit work together in this. So Jesus learned how to be under authority, but he was also in authority. He knew what he had to do. He knew what he needed to call his disciples to do, and he wasn't afraid to do that. So Jesus will help us become mature, mature as a church, mature as 
a, uh, as an individual. And that's what it's all about. Jesus is trying to bring us there. If Jesus ran my life and my church, we'd all be more like him and less like us. And again, that's a good thing, isn't it? That's a good thing. Because the real me and the real you come out when we submit ourselves to Jesus. The best version of me is when I'm submitted to Jesus and he's living his life through me. The best version of this church is when we're submitted to Jesus and to him. And they see him coming out through us. And that's my prayer for our church. Would you mind standing and closing in prayer with me? Father, I thank you so much for your grace. Lord, I thank you for the good news of the gospel and how it's changed our lives. Lord, I thank you for uh, reaching down to us when we didn't want anything to do with you, when we were blinded by Satan uh, and by his kingdom, and we had no idea uh, what was missing in our lives. Uh, Lord, we had no idea uh, what was out there that we uh, were failing to, to grasp and, and, and the danger that was ahead of us if we kept living the life we did. But Lord, you, you opened our eyes. You reached down to us. You died in our place. You offered us forgiveness. You offer us life. You put us in a body of believers that can support us and, and nurture us. And you give us a mission, Lord, to wrap our lives around that really matters. And, and God, I just thank you for, for this church, for the uh, privilege of being here for a year. I thank you in advance, Lord, of what you're going to do in the future uh, to uh, mature them and to grow them, uh, to spread the good news of Jesus throughout this region, Lord, and, and beyond. And, and my prayer, Father, is that uh, all of us, all of us will make it as our chief end in life, to be mature in Jesus, first of all as individuals, but then, Lord, to do our part to help our church become mature, become the presence of Jesus. Lord, you are the, the actual head of your church right now, and we submit to you, but Lord, we also look forward to that day when as the rightful king of creation, you will return, you will rule, you will reign, and you invite us to be a part of it. Thank you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Don't go anywhere. Jay has some announcements that he would like to make. transition to the foodie part of our celebration and Bill's going to talk about how we're going to all come together for the picture but we're also transitioning another family today um, Taylor and Liz Waring this is their last day with us there they travel an hour maybe a little longer to come here and they've made the decision with our you know the youth groups encouragement that they need to be part of their local community so my uh, desire would be for people to just thank Taylor and Liz for their ministry. They've been a really important part of youth group and we're really excited where they're growing with their family and we're going to miss them and we wish them all the best. So if you get a... If you get a chance, just go up and thank them and just wish them well on their, their next adventures. Thank you.